here on Lanzarote, uh, a brand new venue for a conversation with uh, John Butler. This is a bit of a test, really, because the light and the sound is all different from Bakewell Church. You might be able to hear in the background uh, the, the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. We're in uh, a little town called Arietta on the sheltered coast of Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. And uh, John, I thought with our new venue um, uh, and having the, the ocean literally up on our doorstep, uh, I thought I would ask you about one of the, a couple of the very common analogies used in non-dual speak, one of which is uh, the, the wave in the ocean. Well, if I think back to very, very long ago, when I first started um, um, started reading uh, philosophical books, um, I think I would have found that a very helpful analogy. Um, I'm not so sure about... Uh, the question, what is the wave? But um, but the fact that uh, it it uh, it shows for a few moments and then sinks back into the mass of water again. Yes, I do think that's that's very helpful. Um, it's, it isn't easy to reduce our human condition to such simplicity, is it? And we cling so desperately onto our individuality such as it is while it lasts that um, the thought of it uh, so easily submerging back into anonymity is rather deflating to say the least isn't it to um, what many years later I came to understand as the ego um, our sense of separate existence um, is it really as meaningless as a wave? Am I, John Butler, really of no more significance in the great scheme of things than the rise and fall of a wave? Well, I'll leave you to guess the answer in your own lives. Actually, Strangely enough, now I'm coming to the end of my life, I, I, I absolutely love the thought of, of uh, dissolving back into nothingness. It's the nothingness that I now find is the everything. And the John Butler is really... I don't really quite know what it is or was but I'm only too glad to feel that it's dissolving away into, into, into what? <laughs> Beyond words. No wonder we have to f have a word like God, because <laughs> we don't mention. <laughs> what else can you? What else can you call it? The less of me, John Butler, the more of God. Seems the. Seems the the sort of ultimate, ultimate human attainment. It isn't oblivion, it's the, it's the total opposite of oblivion. I don't think I could have believed this years ago, but it really is true. I wonder if you can understand this. It's what I wrote in my notebook just a few days ago. It's not I that die out of the world. It's the world that dies out of me. Now, is the I called John Butler? No, I don't think it is. In fact, I'm sure it isn't. I don't know that... that I am anything particularly recognisable, but I am... 
the fulfillment of all things. I've never been so alive, so completely fulfilled, complete, as as is quite impossible, quite incomprehensible even to an entity called John Butler. I don't need to go anywhere or do anything or prove anything or say anything. It's home. I never was one really to to, to make much of these wanting to be what I truly am. I, I, I never really particularly liked that way of approaching it. And uh, I suppose often throughout my life, rather like in conditions not dissimilar to here in, in the high, wide open spaces of the world, I've, I felt a longing to be there many, many, many years ago. I remember I, I was in the western United States sleeping out under the stars and uh, I wrote then that there's no place on earth I feel more at home than, than uh, under the stars. Now it seems even the stars are within me and what draws me most is that infinite, well it looks like dark from the world, but actually isn't, it's not dark at all, it's, it's light. Perhaps it seems dark to our earthly sight, because everything in, in the real world is the other way around. Dark is light. Anyway, all such words as dark and light sound seem rather silly. Is, you can't really put it into those dualistic words, all that melt, melts away. Completeness is just total fulfillment. And, and all, all that the world offers us in terms of amusement or you know, impressions, it all sort of dies out as, yes, they've all good and valid in their time, but, but it's uh, far, far, far away, like a fading dream now. The whole world is, is like that, the world that once contained us is now contained as our Yes, the world that once contained us is now contained in me. And uh, I suppose rather like a meal, which seems important when you're eating it, but when it goes into your digestion, you, you lose sight of it. It's sort of, it uh, has been, isn't it? You can't even remember what you ate a few hours ago. Total fulfillment. I suppose that's why I feel so deeply content with the elemental features of a place like this. Light, water, rock. Somehow they become much more my brethren than somehow these I suppose you could call it the human scene, really. Does that make me inhuman? It doesn't feel like that. At all. I don't really care for that word, 
human and humanity, it seems too transitory, really, too inadequate to express the completeness that one really is. I will lift up my mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That's how it's put in the Psalms, isn't it? <laughs> the infinite sky. So often we live in un under, even the infinite sky is hidden by clouds at home and come to a place like this and uh, the pure, the pure unclouded uh, sky it seems normal really and, uh, and the cliff tops, the tops of the volcanoes sort of melt into this infinitude. Our eyes are focused on to the volcanoes and the, you know, the effects of lava and all this and mind seeks to explain it but, but in a way our eyes are lowered aren't they, lowered to earth to see that and, and this deep heart's yearning, at least for me, it's always yearning for the beyond. I used to talk in terms of this longing for silence, longing for space. No, it's it's more spiritual thing. Which of course doesn't have to be outside, you can be anywhere. <laughs> Into thy hands. O oh Lord, I commend my spirit. And those are the last words of Jesus. I feel so ready to do that now. I don't know how many more years I've got to live, but, but it seems a complete uh, fulfillment to life and to thy hands, the surrender of separate existence into into God, the God that now seems not far away but, but the closest of the close, so I hardly know where I end and he begins, I, I can't really in a way talk of him as something separate, it seems rather false, so much brought back to silence, and here I find myself compelled to speak into a microphone, I hope these words don't sound too silly to you. Forgive me if they are. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes, you know, tears just come into my eyes. I think probably that's the ultimate language. <laughs> I think I remember a story of, of some saint or other who, on his deathbed, he sort of just before he breathed his last, a tear rolled down his cheek. <laughs> and I, and <laughs> God knows I'm no saint, but, but somehow some like that seems to express what uh, words eventually get reduced. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? You, you shed a tear one moment and laugh the next. <laughs> Just about sums up the human condition, don't you? <laughs> and, uh, well, we make heavy labour of it, don't we? Struggling, <laughs> trying to <laughs> figure out what it's all about. Mm. Life. There's another expression, John. Uh, in the, the vocabulary, in the lexicon of non-duality that, uh, that we've all picked up, which is one without a second. 
Yes. When, when I first heard that, I thought it was talking about hours, minutes, and seconds. And yeah. I, thought it, yeah. I thought it was something to do with time standing <laughs> still, but it, I, I believe I'm mistaken. And it, it's, it's oneness without separation yes, yes. of a second. Yes, that's right. Yes, I remember being told that many, many years ago. Well, it seemed completely unattainable then. Um, I remember my, struggling my early years of meditation. But now it seems, yes, one of the few sort of really valid things you can say, one without a second. Yes, in a way that takes away all these problems about what is God, doesn't it? What are you aiming for? Mm, one without a second. Yes, that's very good. You can hear the sound of the waves on the shore just a few yards outside the window. That's like that wave, how much? I hope you can hear the waves and, and let my voice, such as it is, fade out. The wave finally goes back into the ocean. Can you say a little something, John, about a concept that I struggle with? I'm familiar with this idea of that it's not that the, the, the microcosm and the macrocosm, or the world on the outside as opposed to the world on the inside, mm -hmm. and this idea of containing mm -hmm. the world within. Yes. Yes, it is, a, again, a very, very helpful concept that um, and which helped me greatly many years ago, that, um, that man, you and me, that is, <coughs> is a microcosm of the macrocosm. I wonder if you understand, I, I, of course I didn't understand these words, but the macrocosm is really everything, the, the whole bag of tricks, you know, the, the universe, and even beyond the universe. Because of course now we have to include all the latest discoveries, don't we, that seem to go on forever. And, and, and this is, is all, um, well I've just been telling you, haven't you, from my own experience, that it's all actually contained within within me, um, not that is the ego, within the greater me, the real me, um, what I am, so that, uh, that 
we could either choose the way of science or, so, or, or, or something, the, uh, studying the macrocosm with ever more clever instruments, or we can we can uh, we can make a study of ourselves and um, and uh, far beyond worldly knowledge, that is describable knowledge, um, encyclopedic knowledge, is the uh, ever deepening realization that we may attain through the practice of meditation. Um, the macrocosm, yes, and the microcosm. In fact, I suppose I've just been telling you that, haven't I, at the start of this video, that, that uh, uh, how everything is I mean, I must have realized it because I couldn't be able to speak this way, could I? It's actually, it's all contained within... I, I, I don't know how I could avoid using the word me, but, but think of it as me with a capital, in capital letters. Um, how it's all contained within me, and in that one without a second, well... Again, I'm shy to use the word God, it doesn't... <laughs> my conditioning makes me... Sort of, uh, I shouldn't be using that word, but but it really is. Uh, you come to one without a second. It isn't uh, something and something else. It's just it's just like the wave literally melting into the oneness of the ocean. It's, it's indivisible. It it is one. Um, you could use the word oneself. The, that again has never really appealed to me, but it it does. Uh, it does express things as they are, just one, one, just one, that's all this is, just... And see, you, we begin to appreciate this by, first of all, realizing the stillness, that this invisible containment in which we sit, as the Bible puts it, in which we live and move and have our being. And once we begin to get a taste of this stillness, um, become familiar with this, and uh, so that it becomes a, an integral part of our uh, daily life experience, um, it becomes ever more attractive to us, ever more meaningful to us, in contrast to the often the meaningless jumble that comes into our minds and into our thought, into our thoughts and into our Unfortunately, it comes out in our words. Um, the more one becomes <laughs> sort of integrated into this stillness, the, it shows up the the uh, the absurdity which we can begin to realize is is is, is well described as sin. Our, our, willing or unwilling, turn away from the, from the total meaningfulness which uh, is approached or can be approached through the medium of stillness, coming to rest. You could uh, again think of the wave, and that, yes, the wave has some meaning, doesn't it? But um, perhaps you could. It's not so difficult to say that the ocean seems to have more meaning, was more fulfilling, more complete. Somehow, the ocean contains the waves. Yes, the macro microcosm, dear friends, do. Uh, Keep that in mind, it's a very most useful. Um, most useful concept to help us. Another another concept, John, that I found helpful. I had the opportunity in uh, on my visit to India to to visit the Ramana Maharshi yes. ashram and uh, yes. they 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 told me where he, he used to live in a, 
a cave yes, for some yes, years yes, yes. and you can actually visit the cave yes, and yes. sit in there in the, yes. in the quiet and the darkness and meditate and uh, at the Shantivanam ashram uh, the, which was set up by two Benedictine monks mm -hmm. B. Griffiths and uh, Henry Lasso. Henry Lasso uh, took up the name Abhi Shiktananda which mm -hmm. I love the way that sounds mm -hmm. Abhi Shiktananda, um, he loved to use the expression the cave of the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this shift of focus from the outer mm -hmm. to the inner mm -hmm. to the cave of the heart, I mm -hmm. find helpful too. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, caves. Yes, I've been lucky enough to, to have several cave experiences in my life. This is wonderful. Uh, to find yourself deep in the bowels of the earth, in utter darkness. Many years ago I was on Mount Athos, a famous place of, of uh, orthodox monasticism. In Greece, and um, there was a monastery there, perched up on high up on the cliffs, overlooking the sea. Not dissimilar, really, to here. And um, you think there couldn't be a more perfect place to meditate, really? The sea below and the stars above, out on the lovely, warm, warm evening, summer evenings. And there was a there. They had a saint called um, Saint Simeon, I think, and we were taken into the cave, and uh, and there, with all that glorious scenery around him, he he went into this pitch dark cave. You scramble up a sort of pothole, and there's a sort of ledge there where apparently he sat. You can sit there. How? What? I, I remember asking myself, almost with horror, how could anyone? Sort of turn from such glorious scenery to just immerse himself in pitch darkness. Um, I've never done that myself or felt the need to, but I can certainly sympathise with that now, because even the it, it's unbelievable, but it's absolutely true that even the rocks, you know, even the the most massive manifestations of of nature, the mightiest mountains and glorious, glorious uh, vistas of this world are, are really, I could always call them playthings of, playthings of time and space. Can you believe that? I didn't think I could have believed it, certainly not as a, a young man, but you know, now I'm using the words myself to, to say it. So at least for me, the 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 the, the compulsion to to be to visit and if possible to dwell among such things that drove me so much as a young man has now completely vanished. I have no need to travel the world any longer to find these things. Yes, the very rocks, the very how many billions of year old rocks are, are really just the measurements of time and space. And of course time and space completely melt away, become meaningless as you draw closer to the, the one. Funny, isn't it? It's so simple, it's so obvious when you see it. There's no question there. You know, the world could, the whole world could laugh at me and burn me at the stake as a heretic. Or something, but you can't change it. You know it. It's become. It's it's your reality. You see it. You become it. <laughs> Take it or leave it as you wish. But there you are. I'm just looking for some matches, John. To to burn me, <laughs> to burn me at the stake. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>
Mm-hmm.